Hi, everybody. It's good to be with you. How's everyone doing? I'm Eric. I am one of the pastors on staff. It's great to be with you this weekend. And I want to start off by making an observation, and that is that in life, there are two main leadership challenges that you and I will run into. There's the challenge of getting things together, and then there's the challenge of keeping things together. For example, there's the challenge of getting into college. And then there's the challenge of staying in college. Both require effort, both take a lot of work, but a different motivation and a different mindset. Or there's the challenge of getting a job, and there's the challenge of keeping a job. Or this was especially relevant to me a few years ago, there's the challenge of getting a baby to sleep, and then there's the challenge of keeping a baby asleep. Can I get an amen from parents and guardians and grandparents? I remember you do all this work to shush and rock and cuddle and bounce and walk around. And then you do the very delicate handoff to the crib and step away. And then for the love of all that is holy, if a mouse as much as hiccups in this house, we are on a search and destroy mission to make sure that that house stays as quiet as possible because you and I know that all it takes is one little cry and you're all the way back at where you started to begin with. I think life is full of those moments when we've probably all experienced this, where we've achieved something significant and then realize that the victory that we achieved was short-lived and that there was actually more work to be done. It's why I brought up with me, if I can get this out, this retainer case. Because it reminds me of my orthodontics journey back in middle school. Uh, and I had the full experience, too. I had a massive overbite, so I had to do the headgear at night. Uh, I had those tiny little rubber bands that you had to put in. I don't know if they still do that or not. They're probably still in my parents' car uh, from all the way back in middle school. I had to put the wax on the front of my braces because they would cut up my lips, you know? And so I remember the sweet bliss that came on that day that they took off the braces. I kept licking the front of my teeth kind of over and over again because it just felt so smooth. And everybody wanted, you know, pictures to show off my perfectly aligned teeth. And then my orthodontist comes and hands me something like this. And he says that basically for the rest of my life, I have to wear a retainer if I want to keep my teeth in line. Uh, by the way, this isn't actually my retainer, so you can tell how seriously I took his advice. I took seriously the first challenge of getting my teeth together, but I kind of blew off the second challenge of trying to keep my, or of trying to have them stay together on the long term. And you can guess what my teeth look like today. <laughs> you know, in life, that's kind of the way it works, where we achieve something significant and then things can sometimes easily fall apart. I mean, the first part of this series on the book of Nehemiah has really been about that first challenge, about how Nehemiah rallied a group of people to do something really significant, that in 52 days, which is record time, they were able to rebuild the wall around the city of Jerusalem, uh, which is something that God had put on Nehemiah's heart. And it was a significant victory that required a ton of work and uh, was a big moment of celebration for those people. But as we'll see, they kind of blew off the second part of the challenge and things quickly fall apart and their victory was short-lived. You know, none of us want our victories in life to be short-lived. And if we don't master this second challenge of, of leading ourselves in our life, um, we can go quickly from a great moment in life to things looking like the bottom row of my teeth, kind of out of alignment, kind of messed up. And that's what happens here. And so that's why I'm so grateful that this last part of the book of Nehemiah is actually in the Bible, because it's so instructive about how you and I can go about maintaining momentum in our life, because we want to get this right, and all of us want our victories to be ongoing. And so uh, let's pick up where we left off from uh, two weeks ago when Jeff was talking about celebration. Because when we left them, this was in a moment where a lot had come together. They had gotten a lot together. Not only had they gotten the wall back together, but the people of God had come back together in a significant way as well. Like if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, it was at this moment that they read the Old Testament law right when they were dedicating, uh, right when they were dedicating the wall, they, they read the Old Testament law and they were just wrecked by it. Because they realized that they hadn't been 
following it in their life. And so it's at this moment that they recommitted to being the people of God, and they do it in a very public way. This is in Nehemiah 9 and 10. It says, in view of all of this, basically in view of what they had just read uh, in the Old Testament, we, this is Nehemiah and these leaders, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing. And our leaders, our Levites and our priests are affixing their seals to it that the leaders, starting with Nehemiah, they literally sign the dotted line to be the people of God again. And not only do they sign it, everybody signs it. It says, the rest of the people, together with their wives and all the sons and daughters who are able to understand, all these now join their fellow Israelites, the nobles, and bind themselves to obey the carefully all the commands and regulations and decrees of our Lord. They make a commitment to be the people of God, which the commitment for them is based on the Old Testament law. I mean, we aren't under the Old Testament law today, but they were. And that shaped the commitments that they were making in this moment of clarity. And I wanna outline for you really quick the three commitments that they were making, because it's significant, and we'll talk about why that's applicable to us today. But these three main commitments were all based around the Old Testament law, and there's big categories. Uh, The first big category was they made a financial commitment, that they decided that they wanted to provide for the temple. You know, they had just built this wall all around the temple, and they're now going to provide financially for it. They make a commitment to reinstate the temple tax, which was a special tax that would help provide the supplies that would go on uh, for the the worship services and the, the sacrifices and the things that would happen there. And they also agree to reinstate the tithe. Uh, A tithe is literally a tenth of their income. And it's what the Old Testament had prescribed that they do, that they give up a tenth of their income so that they could pay for uh, the salaries of the Levites. Those were the priests and the temple workers, the people that would make the services happen. In fact, if you were to look through all of the Old Testament and the Old Testament law, it, they had multiple tithes at different times of the year or different uh, seasons that they would need to do. There were other tithes that would be given for the poor. There was other tithes that were given for uh, big feasts and celebrations. And so on any given uh, year, uh, you may have up to 30% of your income that you would give uh, for making everything happen that God had commanded the people to do, which is crazy. And yet in this moment of clarity, after they had seen all that God had done, they signed up for it. They said, yeah, we're absolutely on board with that. So there's a financial commitment. There's also a family or a faith commitment. And that was to honor the Sabbath, which meant that they were committing to not do work of any kind on one day of the week, uh, which is really actually a big faith step. Uh, because they lived in an agrarian culture, which meant that they had to do work every single day to grow the crops or tend to the fields or tend to their cattle. And so to not work one day of the week meant that they were committing to not tend to what needed to be tended to or uh, to not gather what needed to be gathered or buy or sell what needed to be bought or sold uh, to make their lives work. But it was something that the Old Testament law had commanded them to do. And they said, okay, we're going to recommit to doing this big faith commitment to honor God and say, hey, once a week, we wanna reconnect with him. We wanna rest like he has commanded us to do. The third category was a family commitment. And this commitment was to not, uh, not to intermarry, specifically regarding the marriage of their children. And Nehemiah 10, 30 uh, lays this out for us. It says that we promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or to take their daughters for our sons that the people of Israel were prohibited from marrying people of surrounding cultures, which is kind of strange. You know, when you, when you read this one, it's almost as if like, does God have a problem with the marriage of people from different races? And, and so let's talk about that just for a moment because that's not what this is saying. In, in the Old Testament, the way that God was working was primarily through one people group, the nation of Israel. He was like, okay, through this nation, I'm going to bless the world. I'm going to show my reign and my rule and my blessing. And I'm going to work through this people group as they go into the promised land and are working to bless the nations and also to welcome in the foreigner, the sojourner. They were meant to be welcoming, but God was working through this people group. 
And as this people group was going through different nations, the surrounding peoples were following different gods and different religions, which when you read the Old Testament, there was some kind of sketchy stuff that would happen at times. Sometimes even things like child sacrifice and things that God was like, hey, that's not good. I don't want you to fall into that. And so God knew that if the people, uh, his people intermarried with people from the other nations, that it would pull their heart, pull their devotion from him. In fact, that's exactly what happened with Solomon, one of the famous kings of Israel. It says this in King, 1 Kings 11:4 that as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart toward other gods and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord. And so this commitment is about the spiritual trajectory of their families. Which by the way, this commitment and this principle still applies today. It looks a little different, but the principle is the same. That uh, as you and I are forming our families, if we are Christ followers, that we are to align our lives with other Christ followers. If we're to marry someone, it's to marry someone else that shares that same commitment so that our hearts are pulling in the same direction. It has nothing to do with race or national identity. The church is meant to be a place that God is pulling together all nations and all peoples and all cultures together. And multi-ethnic churches are Jesus' dream. It's what he wants for us. And multi-ethnic families are a beautiful representation of that. So are we clear on that, that it's not? Yeah. So three big commitments, a financial commitment, a faith commitment, and a family commitment. And if this is where the book ends, this would be a happily ever after moment. You know, a ride off into the sunset, the cowboys go off there, the credits roll in the movie. But this isn't where the book ends. Uh, Nehemiah, right after this, uh, returns back to where he had come from. Uh, We read this in Nehemiah 13. It says, in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I, this is Nehemiah speaking, I returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. So here's what's happening here. That when Nehemiah, at the beginning of the series, we talked about this, that Israel was in captivity to Persia. Uh, the, God's people had been put in exile. And so Nehemiah had this big dream that had been put on his heart and that God had placed on it. And he said, okay, I I want to go back to my people. I want to rebuild this wall that has been destroyed. And so he has to ask permission from King Artaxerxes, the person that he serves to. And so the king gives permission. He actually offers to finance the very project that Nehemiah had wanted done, but he doesn't send him with a one-way ticket. He says, hey, you're in service to me. At some point, you need to come back. And so As we do the math from the years that are here, Nehemiah spent 12 years in Jerusalem rebuilding the wall. And after those 12 years are done, he's like, okay, I have to go back to the king. So he goes back to the king. And then it reads that sometime later, we don't know exactly how much time. Uh, It's at least a few years as we'll see in a moment, but most scholars would put it at about 10 to 12 years that he was gone from Jerusalem and he comes back. And what he finds is not good. It says this in Nehemiah 13. He said, here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. So to give context here, Eliashib is a priest that had been appointed to run the temple while Nehemiah was gone. And what has he done when when Nehemiah comes back? He sees that this priest has allowed Tobiah And if you have been following along in this series, Tobiah was the arch enemy of Nehemiah. He was against everything that God had been doing. He had been out to kind of seek and destroy all that was going on. And so not only had he been allowed in the temple, this priest allowed Tobiah, one of the enemies of God, to live in the temple. And get this, it gets messier, that the room that he was living in in the temple was actually the room where they were supposed to be uh, storing all of the supplies that would be happening for worship. This is where all of the different stuff would be for them to pull off worship services, which means worship services weren't happening. And he says, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them. This is again the tithe. And that all the Levites and singers responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. That, again, 
because the people weren't honoring their financial commitment, the tithe wasn't happening, so the workers were like, we have no money. So they go back to doing what they had been doing uh, and gave up on that commitment. So the financial commitment, the temple is in disarray, the tithe, not happening, continues. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. Basically, they're doing lots of work. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. So the faith commitment, there's lots of work being done on the Sabbath, it continues. Moreover, in those days, I saw the men of Judah who had, been, who had married women from Ashdod, Amnon, and Moab. And this is where we know that it was more than just a few months. It says half of their children, so they've had children, spiritual trajectory of their families. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. The family commitment. There are lots of weddings, lots of kids that are happening outside of this commitment. And the spiritual trajectory of these families, they're not growing up knowing about God. So pretty much none of the commitments are being kept, which is pretty discouraging and also pretty relatable too, because the second challenge is hard. I actually love uh, in a weird way that this part is included in the Bible. Like I love it. I actually love that the Bible is so real and it's full of real people and real lives because real people and real lives, like they don't work like the movies. I mean, we know that. Like there isn't a happily ever after in our life on this side of heaven. And that all of us are works in progress. All of us have challenges that we face. Um, and all of us are, are gonna have room to grow that the journey doesn't end just when we feel like we reached a victory point. In fact, I think victory moments in our life are great and you and I should celebrate them. But if we're honest, victory moments can be a bit arbitrary too. Uh, it's almost like, you know, when we are celebrating one thing, I think we all know that there probably still is work to be done. And that, hey, even if I've got progress in this one area of my life, there's probably pro stuff that is broken in another area of life that needs fixing. So I, one of the things that we say here at Chase Oaks is that we're all in the same boat. Uh, and what we mean by that is that all of us are works in progress, that none of us have arrived on this side of heaven, which means that uh, you know, even for someone like me that's up on a platform, that there's areas of my life that I'm growing too. And we all are growing in this together. That's how the Bible talks about growth, that it's a journey. And it's a journey that continues on. Now, uh, again, most of us probably get that in principle. And, and I'm betting the Israelites did too. But what we see here in this part of the Bible is that they weren't ready for the journey part. That they didn't have a journey mindset. They weren't ready for the second challenge. That when it came to thinking about their moment, they hadn't figured out how to move from a commitment in a time of victory to having something that set them up for the journey, which the way I'll phrase this is having a compass. And let me illustrate what I mean by having a compass. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I had wanted to get away from my house to do some work on my own, uh, and I wanted to work on some core values in my life. Like I had some friends and mentors who had done a lot of work. They had come up with some guiding principles. They actually figured out how to word them in a really clear and succinct way. And I was inspired by that. So I'm like, okay, I really wanna do that work and, and figure out like, okay, who, what's core and central to me and who I wanna be. And so I was able to get away and I, I wound up coming up with five different statements and even, and I was proud of this, I even assigned a Bible verse to most of those statements and felt pretty good about it. And then I got home. And so I'm at home and I'm sitting at, this is maybe a week or two later, I'm sitting at the countertop, I'm having lunch and I remember what I'm having because of what's about to happen. I, uh, I was having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a PB and J, doesn't get any better than that. And I was scrolling through my phone and scrolling through my email and I saw a bunch of uh, Amazon receipts. 
uh, and they were digital downloads, which is a little unusual for, for our household. So I clicked on one, and one of them said, Dragonlands Expansion Pack, $109.99. Now, Dragonlands isn't a land that I've experienced before. I'm pretty sure I would have remembered if I had, and I certainly would remember if I wanted to expand that experience. <laughs> and so I immediately went and talked to my two sons about it because they have Amazon Fire Pads with what I thought were adequate parental controls. And when I asked them about it, um, they immediately, you know, said, oh yeah, well, we just knew that we needed to load up on Dragon Coin. In fact, when I had added up all of the receipts in our inbox, it was $315 worth of Dragon Coin that they had decided that they needed. Making commitments in a moment. You know, writing my core values in the mountains is one thing, that's great. These are the moments when life gets real, when we test the durability of who it is that we say we wanna be and how our commitments, how strong our commitments really, really are. Uh, two of my core value statements that I had were words matter and error on the side of grace. <laughs> yeah, and I would love to say my first reaction mirrored those statements and they did not. Um, but I, I will say this, that doing that work ahead of time, doing that work over there actually gave me uh, something to reflect on. Like I, I remembered those two statements uh, uh, about half of a day later and I'm reflecting on it, yeah. I'm reflecting on it and, I, and, I, and as I reflected on it, it actually gave me something to kind of reflect with. It said, okay, if, if words matter here, I didn't, I didn't in that moment when I reacted to my kids, I, I didn't in that moment really think about my words as much as I should have. And when I reflected on error on the side of grace, I actually, it was pretty helpful because as I did, and part of that statement for me is assuming the best. That's part of what I think of error on the side of grace is. And I realized in that moment, I hadn't assumed the best because you know, my sons, they, they had never done anything like that before. Like this was a first time kind of offense that that had happened. Um, and any of us know, I mean, any of us that have any kind of device, they, we know that those in-app purchases can be really, really misleading. I mean, to them, all they know is that they need a Dragon Coin to make the app work. And so they decided to purchase a lot of Dragon Coin to make it work. But it made me realize that, you know what, this, this isn't necessarily, this what didn't reflect who I wanted to be. It was a moment to recalibrate and reorient around uh, my commitments. I like how Bill George words it because this is what it means to have a compass mentality. Uh, he is a author and a leadership expert. Uh, he's a former CEO of a major company and he wrote a book called True North, which is great, but this is what he says about it. He says, True North is the internal compass that guides you successfully through life. It represents who you are at the deepest level. It is your orienting point, your fixed point in a spinning world that helps you stay on track as a leader. And that when you get too far off course, your internal compass tells you that something is wrong and that you need to reorient yourself. The Israelites had lost their compass. Uh, they, they had lost their true north. And, and how do we know that? And it's not because they screwed up. Like that's not it at all. Any journey that we are on has its ups and downs. Um, it's not that there were some downs in that moment. What, why they had lost their true north and why they had lost their compass is that nothing or no one at, for 12 years caused them to recalibrate and reorient in the moment. And what should scare us is not that we have downs in our journey. Like as you think of your life, uh, those are gonna happen. What should scare us is when we lose our true north. And that's what happened for the Israelites and that's what can happen and often does happen for all of us. I mean, we're all human and it's easy to lose track but there's so much at stake with that. And so let's just get really practical for a moment of like, okay, well, how do I, if I'm trying to master this second challenge of staying on track and I'm trying to make sure I have a compass, like what does it actually look like? And that's why I did bring up with me uh, this retainer case. Again, this is my 
uh, wonderful admin uh, lens retainer. So she actually knows better about keeping up with the challenge of that. Um, the retainer's not in here, by the way. I think people would get freaked out by that if it was. It's just an empty case. But a retainer is kind of like a compass, because compasses can take lots of different forms. Again, remember, a compass is anything that helps reorient and recalibrate around a true north. In this case, a true north for your teeth. But it can work in lots of different ways. And let's just get really specific about what that could look like. Like, take a financial commitment. Again, the Israelites had made a financial commitment when it came to their relationship with God. Again, for them, they were under the Old Testament law. So that meant that they wanted to tithe or do 10% of their income. Uh, you and I, if we're Christ followers, we're not under the law anymore. Um, the, a tithe is a great starting point, but what we are instructed to do is to live a generosity-driven life. Uh, not a consumption-driven life, but a generosity-driven life where uh, what we give either to God or to causes in the world is at the very top, uh, not at the bottom, and that we're cheerful about it. I imagine, though, even if you're not a Christ follower, I think all of us in here this weekend, we, we want to be generous people. That's a great commitment and desire to have. But a compass would look much more like a budget where you actually have a spreadsheet where you put the percentage or the dollar amount that you, wanna, that you wanna give. It's not just a reactionary thing. It's like, okay, this is a part of my life. And it's a budget that you can check back in with every month or so to say, okay, well, am I actually living into the commitment? That's a, that's a compass. Or take a faith commitment. Again, for the Israelites, what that looked like was the Sabbath, that they, they wanted to honor that one day of the week uh, and as a, uh, something that God had instructed them to do. Um, those of us that are Christ followers, we're not instructed to follow the Sabbath in the same way that they were, but the Sabbath is a beautiful principle of something that you and I are supposed to do, which is to have a deep connection with God or a deepening relationship with him. And part of what he guides us to do is to have a faith rhythm where we are regularly resting and connecting in him. And that's, again, a wonderful commitment and desire to have. But a compass looks like, okay, I've actually got my calendar put out. And I've actually put in there, okay, this is the time I'm spending with God. Or, hey, I'm gonna make uh, attending weekend services at church a priority because it's something, again, that we can check back to and guides us and reorients us around the north that we want in our life. You know, both of those are examples of internal compasses, basically internal checks and balances. But honestly, that's not enough. And it wasn't for the Israelites. That the power of everybody is, is that we often need external compasses to come into our life to also help us reorient and guide us. And that's what Nehemiah does. And so finishing up the story here in Nehemiah 13, this is what Nehemiah does when he finds out about the commitments. It's, he says, I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was, and I think this is a euphemism, euphemism I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back in the equipment of the house of God with grain offerings and incense. So he Throws Tobiah out, he restores temple worship, and he restores the tithes too. Then he continues, when, when evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath was, order, was over. Again, he puts in structure, he puts in system. I stationed men at the gates so no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. He reinstates the Sabbath and provide structure so no work could be done. And for the intermarriage issue, he gets, he gets really angry at this, uh, especially at the guys who hadn't kept this commitment. Uh, he says, I rebuked them and called down curses on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I mean, he goes WWE on them. I mean, this is like SmackDown session that's going on here, which is a leadership style. I'm not sure. I, I don't think anybody would ever mistake me for a wrestler in the WWE. That's just not my MO. Um, and, and honestly, that's part of the power of everybody is that at different times in our life, we need different types of people. People that are still with us and committed and friends of us that they know the true north, but whether it's the comforter or the challenger or the encourager or the confronter, we all need different external compasses that we empower in our life to say, okay, I need help. This is where I wanna go. Please reorient me. Help me recalibrate in the moment. 
That's true for us in our personal trajectories. It's true for us when it comes to our trajectories as a group of people as well. Like here at Chase Oaks, we are committed to staying on track together as a church. Um, I love that we have some doctrinal uh, beliefs that ground us in terms of this is what we believe. But I also love that we have some statements that um, help us kind of our core values as a church. They help guide us and shape us in terms of our decision-making. In fact, a couple of years ago, I, I think this was right around the time of the pandemic, we um, redid or kind of clarified a lot of our DNA statements. You'll see them out in the lobbies at all of our campuses. Um, we put them together and, and Jeff uh, explains each of these DNA statements kind of in depth in a, uh, we have it as a free resource. It's a book called How We Roll. Uh, you can access that uh, this weekend. You can just go to our website. You'll see it as you scroll down there, or you can scan the QR code if you're in one of our auditoriums, and you can get access to that. And I just highly encourage you to say, okay, let, like, man, I'm curious about what is it that we're trying to do together as a church? Like, what are our guiding principles? Um, and as you read that, the reason why we want it to be so accessible and across all of our community is that this is something that guides our decision-making as a group of people, but it also allows us to actually call fouls if we see something, whether it's me or anybody, that says, okay, if this is what you've committed to doing, like, that didn't, that missed the mark there. Like, we need to reorient, we need to recalibrate if we're gonna stay on track. You know, as I close uh, today, uh, I, I wanna speak to those of us in the room who struggle with keeping things together, which as I mentioned, is all of us. Like in different ways and in different areas. I mean, we could look around and think like, oh, all these other people have it together, I'm the screw up. Like Eric, my retainer was broken years and years ago and it's not coming back. All of us struggle with this, but I know there's a, a number of us that maybe as we are hearing about this and even as we're reflecting on the commitments that Israel made back all those years ago and we're like, uh, and maybe just on repeat are different commitments that we've tried to keep in our life that we've not. I wanna speak to those of us that are struggling with the shame and the guilt that comes with those type of things. And what I would invite you to do, and pretty much again, invite all of us to do, is to remember the words that the author of Hebrews wrote, which is that he tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Why does he want us to do that? Because when you and I fix our eyes on Jesus, what that means is we are fixing our eyes on acceptance. I mean, that, that's what God promises to each of us, that as we put our trust in him, that, that then from then on, we don't journey as strangers or foreigners, we journey as the sons and daughters of God. Not because of anything that we've earned, but because of his grace and his acceptance. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we fix our eyes on grace. We fix our eyes on love and on truth. And we fix our eyes on God's empowering presence to come in and meet us wherever we're at. And so that's why if any of us are at a spot where we're like, okay, when it comes to the, the second part of trying to keep my life on track and I'm not very good at it, and maybe even some of us are at a spot where we're like, I just feel like I'm too far off track, like I'm too far God, that Fixing our eyes on Jesus means that, that you're never too far gone because God's, it's God that, who's at work in you and that he's the one that offers to meet you wherever you're at. And wherever you're at, he will turn and recalibrate and empower you and empower me to get back on the track that we want for our lives, that he wants for our lives. And so as you and I reflect on this truth today, and as we think about well, what does it look like to make Jesus our true north? Because when we do, like everything starts to come in line. And so as we make him our true north, think about this in your life today and say, okay, where, where might I be a little off track? Like where might I need to recalibrate or reorient my life in order to get back? Where do I need God's empowering presence, his wisdom? Where do I maybe need to invite somebody else into my life to help me master this second part of the challenge. In fact, an encouragement I would give to all of us is to say that this is a great daily prayer 
to do as an orienting thing at the beginning of the day. It's like, God, okay, you are my true north. And in this day, help me reorient and recalibrate. Help me to be sensitive in this day in whatever you will bring to keep track of where you're at, to keep on track because life is a journey. And it's great to celebrate different moments and occasions. We need to do that, but we need to gear up for the journey ahead and that God promises to meet us there. Would you pray with me? Father, we do thank you that, um, that you put this part of the Bible in the Bible. As a reminder that these aren't stories and fairy tales, they're not just nice things to learn or good moral things. They're, they're real stories of real people with real lives who are just like us. And all of us will struggle with keeping on track. And so Father, would you give us wisdom right now? I know some of us are thinking of different things where it's like, okay, if I'm being honest, I, I might be missing the mark here at the moment. Father, would you meet each of us with wherever that is, with wisdom and with the ability to know how to recalibrate and reorient around your love and your truth. We love you and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as we continue on today, I'm excited that today is a good day to do communion. Um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, is that uh, this weekend is Palm Sunday, uh, which is the beginning of Holy Week, which is so significant as we remember all that Jesus did to come into this world, uh, to teach us and guide us, yes, but also to go to the cross and pay for our sins and to rise again. But on this Palm Sunday weekend, I think too, it's a great chance for us to use this moment to acknowledge our true north, to acknowledge that Jesus is who he says he is. He did what he said he would do and he's here to meet us and empower us to get to where we want to go in life. So you are welcome over this next song. You have the elements in front of you to take them whenever you feel led, whenever you want. And as we do, use it as a moment to recalibrate and reorient around him.